I was able to watch nine movies in theaters last year. Oh wow. I watched Crack, she plays the villain, ah! and that, oh, ah, Hi, welcome to another monthly wrap up with yours truly. Today, we are going to talk about every movie that I watched in February of 2024. Let's start off with some stats, okay? In February, I watched 61 films. Six of those films were shorts and they were Oscar nominated shorts. Another six of those films were rewatches, and everything else was a brand new watch, which is really exciting. I started watching the shorts that were nominated for the Oscars wherever I could find them, but then I stopped because uh, AMC usually shows all of the shorts, like the animated shorts, the documentary shorts, and the live action shorts in theaters, like as an accumulation. And so I stopped thinking, you know, I'd rather watch these all in theaters all at once instead of having to rewatch the ones I've already seen. Um, but my theater still hasn't come up with any kind of show times or anything, and the Oscars are literally like next week, so... Um, I'm kind of, I might not be able to watch all the shorts nominated for the Oscars, but that's okay. You know, I'll do what I can. For this video, I decided to do things a little differently than I did last month. Last month, I went in order of when I watched the movies, and this time I am going to go in, in order of worst movie to best movie but not in a full numerical order, just by stars. So I will be talking about the movies that I gave a half star to that I watched this month, and then I'll go up to one star, one and a half, all the way up to the five stars. So like the big grand finale, you'll have to watch to the end to see the best movies I saw last year. And I watched a lot of movies in theaters too. I was able to watch nine movies in theaters last month, which is one of my better months for sure for movie theater watches. So again, these are in order of lowest rating to highest rating. It's not necessarily this was the worst movie and then this was the second worst movie. I didn't rank it like that. Okay, so it's out of order in the sense of worst to best, but it's in order of least amount of stars to most amount of stars. Okay, let's go. First up, we have Argyle from 2024, directed by Matthew Vaughn. I saw this in theaters at like 11.30 p.m. and it is one of the most unworth it movies I've ever seen. I literally, I never feel like I'm wasting my time when I watch a movie. I wasted my time with this movie. It is five and a half hours long. It has 13 different plot twists in the final 30 minutes alone. It's about a woman who writes a spy series and she gets caught up in a spy... <sighs> and she gets caught up in some kind of international espionage problem. And the whole time in the movie, you're trying to figure out what's the secret, who's the real spy here. And y'all, it's just bad. It's just bad. Like from the very beginning, it's incorrect. From the very beginning, she's doing a book reading for her book that just came out. And she's reading the end of the book at the book reading. No one, they just purchased the book. No one has read the book yet, but they have her reading the very end of the book. I, I could not, like from the very beginning, I was like, what, who, what is going on here? No, it doesn't get better. It gets so much worse. And I'm not even joking. It's literally five and a half hours long. Next, we have Henry Fool from 1997, directed by Hal Hartley. This is part of my Cozy with Posey series, so that means that sometimes I have to watch a bad movie to watch my girl Parker Posey uh, do her thing, and this was definitely one of them. This is actually part of a trilogy uh, by Hal Hartley with the same characters, and each movie is made 10 years apart, um, which is kind of cool. Like, I love that concept for sure because, like, the actors have grown up and, like, there's the actor, the characters have gone through a 10 year span, just like the actors and the director did and everything. And that's definitely very interesting, very Richard Linklater of him. But y'all, this movie is awful. It's about awful people doing awful things, which kind of is my jam, but it was insufferable. It was, in oh my gosh, Henry Fool is insufferable. The most insufferable character. I can't say that enough. Like it's, this it was an easy half star rating for me. I even fell asleep during it and I, I couldn't be bothered to go back to, to see what I had missed because that's how unworth it this movie was for me. I'm so sorry. I only gave one movie one star last month and that was The Last Detail from 1973 directed by Hal Ashby. This is a Jack Nicholson movie. Um, it also has the guy who plays the uncle in National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation, Randy Quaid, 
and he does really good in it. I really like Randy Quaid's performance. And even Otis Young did a great job. Jack Nicholson, he's just being Jack Nicholson the whole movie. Like if you've seen Jack Nicholson once, you've seen him in everything in my opinion. Um, this movie literally did nothing for me. It's about the sailors who are taking this guy um, to be imprisoned for like breaking the rules in the military and everything. I don't know. And it just, it was not, you know, they decide to like give him his good last day, which means that they drink a lot of beer and hire a lot of prostitutes. And it was just like not fun. Like I didn't enjoy it at all. I gave two movies one and a half stars last month. The first one was Lady in the Lake from 1946, directed by Robert Montgomery. And this one is cool because it has first person narration. Like the whole movie starts with the actor looking straight at the camera and she's just talking to the camera the whole time and you're just following her the whole time. And it's, it's just, I don't know. It did nothing for me. Like it was not exciting. It's a noir, but that just, it wasn't a good one in my opinion. I've seen a lot. A lot of them are very mediocre, <laughs> but I still love to watch them. Like they're, it's my favorite genre to watch, but this one was not it. Sorry. The next one and a half star I gave to was Madam Web from 2024. I saw this in theaters. It's directed by S.J. Clarkson and it's part of the Sony Spider-Man universe. Um, if you don't know what this movie's about, it's okay. I don't think anyone really does. It's... <sighs> It looked, it felt like it was a movie solely created to be a one and a half long hour Pepsi product ad. Um, every scene Dakota Johnson is playing with a can of Pepsi and it's very distracting and very weird. Um, I thought all the girls did a great job. Dakota Johnson, I think is so like naturally funny that she is good in superhero movies. Like she would be a good character in the regular MCU. I don't know who they give her to, but she kind of got short staffed for this one though, because they did not put any energy into this movie. Um, as in like the director and the writer and the crew, like no offense, but um, this was just not well made at all. Half the lines sounded like they were dubbed over as well. That was very weird. The sound mixing was so off. I gave three movies two stars last month. The first one was Roadblock from 1951, directed by Harold Daniels. It just instantly forgettable. I don't have a memory of this movie. I don't have a single memory of this movie. I know that it reminded me of Scarlet Street and in my review on Letterboxd, I said, go watch Scarlet Street instead, which is in a phenomenal movie, phenomenal noir. Um, and this one just tried to be like a copycat of it. And no, it's just, there's a better version out there. <laughs> Next up, we have Underworld from 1937, directed by Oscar Michau, I think is how you say his last name. Um, it, I watched it on Tubi and Tubi is such a hit or miss, especially with older movies. Um, it's not remastered. The quality is exactly what it was in 1937. There's no subtitles or anything like that. It was a hard watch. It was hard for me to catch every bit of dialogue and really like understand everything that was going on. It's about a man who becomes a gambler. It's like a very cut and dry story from the 1930s, 1940s in that aspect. But um, it just, it, it was, it, it was a bad viewing experience. So it's not really the movie's fault that it was made in 1937, but it is also like a carbon copy of a lot of movies that have been made that are about gamblers. <laughs> Last one, we have Backfire from 1950, directed by Vincent Sherman. Um, I don't remember this movie. I don't have a memory of this movie. <laughs> it's a noir about a guy trying to clear his name, trying to clear his friend's name, and I, literally nothing stood out to me, so we're gonna move on. I gave six movies, two and a half stars last month. The first one was I Wouldn't Be In Your Shoes from 1948, directed by William Nye. Another noir, you guys know me. This one's pretty cool. It's about a man who is wrongly accused of a murder and his wife is working behind the scenes to try to clear his name. And I thought that it was good. It I didn't have anything that I haven't seen before. Like it didn't surprise me. I've seen this story a lot in the movies that I watch, but, um, I remember the cinematography really being really good and the tension at the end, all the courtroom scenes and all of that was, was done well. It was just a very like flat, good, let's move on with our life kind of movie. Next, I watched Saboteur from 1942, directed by Alfred Hitchcock. I'm finally getting into his older movies and one day I would love to sit and watch all of his movies from like his first feature length up until his last one. And just that, I feel like that would be fun, a fun little challenge, a fun little like, way to see his artistry grow. This is another wrongly accused noir, okay? They're fighting to clear his name. Um, at the end, they have the big fight like 
on top of the Statue of Liberty, which was really cool. And Alfred Hitchcock was always doing stuff like that back then. And it's crazy that this movie's from 1942 and he like did something like that. Like it sounds like something that he would have probably tried to attempt in like the 60s. But yeah, that was definitely a good ending. Definitely, I'll remember that for a while. Up next for two and a half stars is Twilight New Moon. Um, I am doing a Twilight series for you guys. So I had to rewatch that movie. And yes, it has two and a half stars. It's not a good movie, okay guys? It's from 2009, directed by Chris Weitz. Um, what can I say about this? First of all, Jacob does the Bella, where the hell you been, Loka line again, and I couldn't, <laughs> like they couldn't help themselves. Like they had to add it back in. That's so funny. It's just, <sighs> I'm sorry, it wasn't fun. I'm gonna go more into this in my Twilight review video. So I'm not gonna talk a lot about it, but yes, I give it two and a half stars and I'm standing by that. Another two and a half star, the one right after New Moon was Eclipse actually, from 2010, directed by David Slade. Um, what's up with that ring? Let's, I wanna talk about that ring because it is ugly. It's very ugly. Um, I would, I would not like that ring if it was me. This one's good because there is, there are a lot of human moments with Bella, like the graduation and the party after graduation. Um, I feel like the tension between Edward and Bella, or sorry, the tension between Edward and Jacob and Bella is good. Like they do fine with the love triangle. It still gets two and a half stars for me. Very weird that they changed Victoria to be played by Bra Bryce Dallas Howard right at the end. Um, she offers nothing to the movie. She doesn't have any great scenes of acting or anything like that. It was just a weird choice. Like I, I need to do some research and find out why they changed the actress. Cause maybe it wasn't their fault. Like maybe the actress who originally played Victoria couldn't be in it anymore, there's some conflict, but so then they got Bryce Dallas Howard and put her in an awful wig. <laughs> it's just not good, it's not fun, it's not fresh. The books are a lot more entertaining, just so you know. The next two and a half star I have is Suburbia from 1996, directed by Richard Linklater. And this is absolutely a Richard Linklater film, okay? It's, um, a, it's told in a single day, it's about kids in America. That's what he does best. That's his thing. That's his shtick. So if you like that, give this movie a watch. It's um, pretty racist. It's um, pretty dull. All these boys are just trying to get lucky and the girls are trying to go through traumatic experiences and try to like live their life. It very much didn't stick with me. It didn't say anything powerful to me. It's fine. The final two and a half star movie I watched in February, which is also the last movie that I ended up watching in February was Personal Velocity from 2002, directed by Rebecca Miller. This is another Parker Posey movie that I watched and it's an anthology of three stories about women who are leaving um, toxic and abusive uh, male relationships or relationships with a man. Parker Posey segment is really good. Um, the first segment was very traumatizing. Um, trigger warning below for that. Overall, I really didn't have a good time watching this. It didn't make me feel empowered. It kind of just made me feel a little sick having to watch these abusive relationships on the screen. So it gets two and a half stars and they're all for Parker Posey's performance. Now we are getting into the better movies of the month. It's all uphill from here, girls. These are my three star movies and don't get it twisted. Three stars is a good movie. I will stand by that. We have 10 three star movies for February, 2024. The first one was actually watched on the first day of February. It was Totally Killer from 2023, directed by Nanachika Khan. It is a high school time travel movie about a girl who goes back to the 80s to try and change something that happens to her in the future. And um, I had a fun time with this. It's full of like 80s slang. She like makes friends with her mom and her mom's friend group from when she was in high school. And um, the dialogue is good. The dialogue, there's a lot of like sex jokes and stuff. And after a while, it gets a little repetitive, but um, I thought it was smart. I thought it was fun. A good fun watch for sure. Then I watched The House of Yes from 1997, directed by Mark Waters. This is another Parker Posey movie. Um, it's adapted from a stage play and I can see how it works so much better on the stage. Um, a lot of bits in the movie just fell a little flat. Whereas if I were to see this on stage, I know that I would like it a lot more. Um, it's about a girl who comes to visit her boyfriend's family and they are a lot closer than they seem and a lot crazier than they seem and Parker Posey plays crazy so well. 
Um, it's fun. It's definitely a fun movie, but like I said, it falls a little bit and I'm very interested in seeing a production of this one day. Next, we have The Hound of the Baskervilles from 1959. It's directed by Terrence Fisher. Yes, it's the Sherlock Holmes Hound of the Baskervilles. Um, I want to read this book so bad, mostly because I have seen adaptations of this story so many times. I remember watching an old BBC one as a kid. I remember watching Sherlock as a kid. Um, I've seen this movie now as an adult and I still don't know what the story is about. I can't, The Hound of the Baskervilles, it goes in one ear and out the other. I still had a fun time. The vibes were there, but I could not give you a synopsis of this and I'm so sorry. So I'll read the book instead and then explain it to you like that. Next, we have Bad Hair from 2020 directed by Justin Samin. Um, this is the kind of movie you would watch on the sci-fi channel at 1.30 in the morning back in the day. It's, it's exactly that. It's exactly that. And if you know what I'm talking about and you like what I'm talking about, this movie is definitely for you. It's basically about a black woman who gets a really bad weave and the hair kind of turns on her and it gets very sci-fi and it's... It's entertaining. It's definitely a fun movie. The next three star movie I watched is Cotton Comes to Harlem from 1970, directed by Ossie Davis. This is your typical black exploitation film. Um, it has everything you need and everything that was required of black exploitation films back in the day. Um, the makeup is very good. It's probably my favorite part of the whole movie. <laughs> the next three star movie I watched was in theaters. It was Lisa Frankenstein from 2024, directed by Zelda Williams. This is also written by Diablo Cody, who wrote uh, Jennifer's Body and she wrote Juno. Um, I definitely like everything she writes. I, I think that I would enjoy and watch everything that she has her hand in. Um, it's definitely for me. This is basically about a goth girl in the 80s who brings back a boy from to life, who brings a boy back to life and he's like a zombie. And um, they kind of just right all the wrongs that have been done to her. It's a revenge film for sure. Um, it's fun. It's a fun movie. That's all I'm gonna say. The next movie I gave three stars was another movie in theaters. It was Perfect Days from 2023, directed by Wim Wenders. This is a story about a man who works as a janitor and he literally works the whole movie. Um, it's, <laughs> it's very inspirational in the sense that you can enjoy the little things and you can have a perfect life without all the glitz and the glam. Um, you really learn his story all throughout the movie. It's very, um, show don't tell, which is my favorite way to tell a story. <laughs> and, um, when you understand like everything he came from and everything that happened in his past and like where he's at now, you have such an appreciation for the film. You have such an appreciation for the way that they went about it and the character itself. Um, like I said, it just really, it, it helps you to appreciate the little things in life and the things that make you happy a lot more and to like focus on those things that make you happy and it's a good message for everyone to see you should definitely watch this movie the day after i saw that i went back to the theaters and i watched out of darkness from 2022 directed by andrew cumming and it's crazy that this movie came out in 2022 and it's now just being serviced in theaters in 2024. it's basically a horror movie um about a tribe this is like you know early days like prehistoric times and it's just about this tribe and there's like a mystical being kind of torturing them and following them and just how the tribe reacts how different leaders react and how hierarchy falls and new people rise and it was it was a fine movie definitely fine next we have body and soul from 1925 directed again by oscar machow this is like one of the more famous silent film era films uh, directed by a black man. It's about a man who kind of schemes his way into a lot of people's lives. He like pretends that he's a minister and so a lot of people trust him. Um, he screws over a lot of people, he steals money and he's just kind of like a bad guy the whole movie but um, in the end it's kind of like he learns his lesson but I don't think that he really does. Um, I had I had a fun time watching it, definitely a good silent film to see. He just kind of ruins lives and sometimes it just be like that. The final movie that I gave three stars to last month was The Unbelievable Truth from 1989, also directed by Hal Hartley. There were a lot of Hal Hartley films leaving the Criterion last month, and I tried to watch as many of them as I could because I had some of his movies on my watch list. This is the beginning of uh, Adrienne Shelley being Hal Hartley's muse. Um, he worked with a, with her on a lot of movies and kind of like skyrocketed her, skyrocketed her stardom, which if you don't know who she is, she directed The Waitress. It, you know, Hal Hartley loves to make movies about pedophiles, and this is another one, and I liked it because I really, really liked Adrienne Shelley's character. I liked how 
mature she was and how strong she was and the way that she spoke and the way that she held herself but it's really unbelievable and maybe that's why it's called the unbelievable truth honestly because it's an unbelievable story because at the end of the day it is about a pedophile taking advantage of a little girl and you know you can write as much mature dialogue as you want for that but at the end of the day if that's what the movie's about like you're not getting anything more from me i watched 12 three and a half star movies last month the first one was Re reality reality from 2023 directed by tina sater this movie is all anxiety if you don't know the story of reality winner and the whistle blowing that she did for the 2016 election um it's a cool story i've seen one documentary about it now and i've seen this movie about it and there was another movie that came to sundance this year that i'm definitely gonna watch about it it's it's a story that i don't think i'll ever get tired of basically she works for the nsa and she leaked documents and um went to jail for it and anybody who was like actually involved with the crime that was committed in the leaked document got no jail time or any kind of repercussions or anything like that um, but she did and that's always like really interesting to me just like proving how america actually works it's a uh it's satisfying. It's satisfying to not feel like I'm crazy. It stars Sydney Sweeney, who I love, and it's so anxiety inducing. My review was, um, this is Shiva Baby for political science nerds. It's Sh Shiva Baby is one of the most anxiety rated movies I've ever seen in my life. And this one definitely compares. It's very, it's very cool because the whole movie, the whole script and the whole dialogue is the transcription of the police and reality at her home when they're about to arrest her. So it's every question that they ask her, it's every conversation that they have with her. And um, I think that's a really cool concept. That's definitely really creative and I really enjoyed it. Next, I watched Stella and the Spades from 2019, directed by Taya Risha Poe. And I really liked this. I liked all the actors. It's very... <sighs> I feel like it was a book or something like it, the concept of it is very interesting it's about a school and it's about these different clubs and the dif these different cliques in the school and how they have like a leader and the leaders like get together and talk like at a round table it's very like serious but it's just high school and they're just talking about like the senior prank that they're gonna pull but then like they all have to agree on it and they all just like talk and then like Obviously, people are trying to get the number one spot, so there's a lot of conflict there. Um, I just thought it was really well done. The actors were amazing. It's just, I, I love stories about private school and kids in private school, kids in boarding school. It, that, that's, that kind of thing has always really appealed to me. The next three and a half star movie I watched was in theaters. It was Anyone But You from 2003. This is directed by Will Gluck. And this is a rom-com. This is a rom-com to save rom-coms. I had so much fun watching it. It's definitely not a five star movie in the sense of of the story and the pacing and the plot but I thought that the actors every actor in it did a very good job there's a lot of side characters there's a lot of side hustles going on between the characters they all have different motives and they all achieve their motives and I thought it was well done just for the fact that the characters were so good and the comedy was funny the romance was good um, for sure but the comedy was there for this one it's a forced relationship trope which is not my favorite I actually kind of hate the forced relationship trope it does not sit with me because it's just boring I don't I don't care, honestly. I just don't care about it. But like I said, the movie's really funny. It's worth watching. Next up, we have Daughters of the Dust from 1991, directed by Julie Dash. This is a fantasy movie set in Victorian, like 1901. Um, it's an all black female cast. There's not another kind of person in this movie. And the dialogue is just gorgeous. It's li literally just these women living on an island, living their life. And it's like such an ideal, like ethereal, just like you really feel the womanhood in this movie. And I really liked seeing the world that it created. Next, we have a documentary. And I think that this might be my only documentary of last month. I watched Crack, Cocaine, Conspiracy, and Corruption. It's from 2021. It's directed by Stanley Nelson. Um, this, I have been wanting to watch this for a long time because I have always heard the story of how basically America brought crack cocaine to America in exchange for political favors. And I've been really interested in learning more about that. This was during the 1980s. Basically, just watch the documentary. It will tell you everything that you thought that you needed to know about this whole era when it comes to how crack was pushed to lower income neighborhoods and also how crack um, really just took over, took over businesses in low income neighborhoods. I mean, like 
if it's what's selling, like, how can you blame people trying to make money to survive? You know, it's very, it's a very well-made documentary. There are lots of opinions in it. Um, you talk, you hear from people who sold crack, you hear from people who were in politics during that time, you hear from attorney generals, you hear from police officers, um, you hear from everyone who had anything to do from that time. It's very eye-opening and I learned so much while watching it. Next up is Atlantics from 2019, directed by Maddie Diop. Diop? Um, this is French. It is a sapphic French story. It's a little fantastical. Um, she's basically forced into like an arranged relationship, which is going to be like an arranged marriage basically, but she's in love with someone else. And it's just about like how they persevere, how they deal with that. And if you want a good love story, especially a French one, it's put it on your watch list. Ooh, up next we have The Pirate from 1948, directed by Vincent Minnelli. This is a Judy Garland, Gene Kelly, um, MGM masterpiece musical okay and you know what I'm gonna be so for real right now this story is horrible the way that the movie flows is awful the whole plot is not good if 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 Gene Kelly was not as jaw-droppingly hot in this movie as he was this movie might have one star I'm not even joking his ability his abilities in this movie bump it up a whole three stars from what it probably deserves given how abysmal this plot is. Basically, it's about a girl who admits that she finds pirates to be very hot and Gene Kelly, in an attempt to woo her hand, decides to dress up and act like a pirate and um, yeah, it works. It, it works. Look at him. It works. This has that famous scene where he has a cigarette and he flips it in his mouth, he kisses the girl, and then he flips the cigarette out of his mouth and blows it in her face. Yeah, if you if you uh, know, you know. If you know, if you know, you know. Ooh, we have uh, Meet John Doe from 1941, directed by Frank Capra. This one is pretty interesting. It, it stars Barbara Stanwyck, and it's about a newspaper that she gets fired from, but before, but before she gets fired, she writes an article about how some man named John Doe is gonna kill himself, and the paper, like the article, gets so much praise that she like gets her job back, she's able to finesse it back, but then they have to make a John Doe who's going to quote unquote kill himself. So they scout out a man, um, they learn more about the man, and it's just like heartfelt all throughout. Um, it really talks about life, you know, it's very like introspective in that way. Um, I had fun watching it. It's 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 a fine movie from the 40s. <laughs> Next we have Who Killed Captain Alex from 2010, directed by, and excuse me, Nabwana ICG. Um, this is like the first Ugandan film that gained any kind of popularity and what's really cool about the director is that he just like made these films in his backyard with his friends, with his family, with like anyone in the area, okay, like it, it, neighbors, you know, and it was a movie that was only supposed to be for Ugandans, like it's made by Ugandians for Ugandians, but then when other people got their hands on it and saw just like how fun this movie was. It's an action movie. It's about a military. Um, I didn't love it, but I totally love the work that was put into it. You can tell that this movie was made with so much fun in mind, and I love that. It, it, it plays like a home movie. The effects are very home movie-ish, and I really, really like movies like that, so that's why this has such a high rating, despite the fact that the subject matter is not something I'm normally interested in. It's definitely, it's definitely cool to watch movies from countries that don't have a lot of movies that have ever been made or, like, released, um, worldwide, and so I tried to, like, make an effort to watch those movies just so I can learn more and see more, and this one's definitely, definitely worth it. The next three and a half star movie I watched was Lifeboat from 1944, directed by Alfred Hitchcock. This one was is better than Saboteur, obviously it got a higher rating, duh. But this one is really cool. It's about a bunch of people who were on a boat um, and the boat catches fire, the boat crashes. And so it's all the people who survive from the boat on a lifeboat and like how they survive for the next like week on this boat alone, like trying to get to safety, trying to get the attention of other, sh other ships around them. Um, it's set during World War II. So like there is like a lot of, so there is a lot of, 
conflict between um, any kind of German people who might be on the boat. Um, there's a lot of like prejudices, but then there's a lot of like trickery and sabotage on the boat. Um, there's a lot of personalities. There's like six people on the boat and they all kind of like, it's like their story and then we don't hear from them again. And then the next person's story and we don't hear from them again. So it could have been really, really, really good because the atmosphere and the concept of it was very entertaining, but there was just no follow up with anybody else in the story. So it falls a little flat, but it's probably one of the better Alfred Hitchcock movies I've seen, I'd say. Okay, we got two left for the three and a half stars. We have Faye Grimm from 2006 by Hal Hartley. This is the second installment in the trilogy that he did. Uh, this one is focused on Parker Posey's character from the Henry Fool movie. And rightfully so, and finally so, she kills it. She kills this movie. She is so fun to watch. She's so funny. And the thing about Hal Hartley's movies though is that they literally don't make sense. Like tell me why she is working for the FBI but also working for a Russian espionage team in this movie and I still like honestly don't know if that's even the real plot. I have I couldn't tell you anything that happens in this movie but I know that she is hilarious. I know that she can act her butt off and be so convincing and so, oh, I just, I love everything she's in. Okay, I gotta stop gassing her up like she's my girlfriend. And finally, the last three and a half star movie I watched last month was The Holdovers from 2023, directed by Alexander Payne. I honestly, Alexander Payne is probably one of my favorite directors. He has never missed for me. He has never made a movie below three and a half stars, I, I think. I'll have to fact check that, honestly. But when I think about the movies that he's made, it's a lot of really stellar installments. This movie is about a bunch of people at a boarding school who are hold, held over for the holiday. They have nowhere to go for the holiday. Um, their family is not, they're not able to be with their family for the holiday. And it's just about their stories, their three stories. I loved Divine Joy Randolph's character in this. And sadly, I feel like she was kind of thrown to the wayside. She gets a lot of good screen time. She gets a lot of good story build, but it definitely, definitely focuses on Paul Giamatti's character and Dominic Sess's character. Um, they are definitely the main characters of this. When I, I feel like Divine's story, the character that she plays, her story is just, <sighs> It's so much, it's so much more emotional. It keeps the audience more captivated, I feel like, whereas Dominic and Paul Giamatti's story, I don't know, they just have white boy troubles and it's not that serious. Like it's really not that serious to me. Whereas Divine's story is like definitely more tragic and we could have had more screen time with her. Like she could have been more of a main character than Paul Giamatti was. Everyone does a really good job, really good acting. The cinematography for this looked really good. I loved how it was filmed. We have four four-star movies. The first one, I can't believe I've never seen this movie. I can't believe that I'm actually gonna say that this is the first time I've ever seen 13 Going on 30 from 2004, directed by Gary Winnick. This movie is so fun. It has a young Mark Ruffalo, which I love, which I adore. It's girly, it's flirty, it's fun, it's thriving. I had so I had so much fun watching this movie. I'm totally gonna watch it again in the future. If you don't know what this movie's about by now, go watch the movie, just go watch it. Up next, we have May December from 2023, directed by Todd Haynes. This movie, when I tell you, when I tell you, great screenplay, great script. Charles Melton, um, best supporting actor of the year. It's, it, it is a snub and a crime that he did not get nominated at the Oscars. I'm, I have words, I have words to say. And I know that the Oscars, it's all about money, it's all about promotion, and that like the people who promote the most and put the most money into promoting get the nominations. So like, I get it, but girl, this movie, this movie is secretly a horror movie and I love when movies are secretly a horror movie. When you're watching it and you're not realizing the horror behind the movie and then suddenly as the movie's progressing you're like, oh my god, this is so much darker than I ever thought it would be. It's about a woman, Natalie Portman, who is shadowing a woman, Julianne Moore, um, because she is going to play the character that Julianne Moore plays in a movie. And so she's just following her character to like learn about her and learn her mannerisms and just like be prepared for the movie. And the reason why she's playing her is because she's part of a really crazy story involving Charles Melton. And it's, 
it is totally a movie I would recommend. I think that this is a very good movie. Oh, so I did watch another documentary last month. I watched Four Little Girls from 1997, directed by Spike Lee. This is a documentary about a hate crime that happened in a church in Alabama. Yeah, in Birmingham, Alabama, um, a bomb was basically thrown into a church where a lot of black people attended and um, three girls died in the bombing. So this documentary that Spike Lee did is, it's all about the family, it's all about the girls. It's not so much about the crime, it's not so much about hate crimes in general, it's just a space for the families to talk about their children that died and you can get a perspective of the fact that like, these girls were human whose lives were just absolutely destroyed and sucked away from this world just for what? For hate. It's just, it's it's a powerful documentary for sure. He also interviews a lot of political figures from that time um, who were like in the area, who were part of the story basically and it's a very telling story. Okay, the final four star movie I watched last month was Josie and the Pussycats from 2001 directed by Deborah Kaplan and Harry Elfont. Y'all, I can't believe this movie was made in 2001. The conversation centered around it is consumerism and capitalism in 2001, but it's just as insanely relevant as if it were created in 2024. I, <laughs> I can't, ooh. Ooh, capitalist, when I catch you. <laughs> it's about a, and it's honestly, it's so interesting. This is set in the Archieverse. So like the band Josie and the Pussycats in the Archer, Archie comics, um, this is their story. And it's just, ooh, it's so ahead of its time. The cast is so good. The cast is so good. This is another Parker Posey movie. She plays the villain. Ah! She should play more villains. She's so good at it. With a rewatch, I could totally see myself upping this to even like a four and a half, maybe a five if I love it that much again. It's, it's a very entertaining, very entertaining watch. Very ahead of its time and so fun, so funny. Okay. I watched 12 four and a half star movies last month. I didn't know that I, that's a big number. That's a, those four and a half stars is the kind of rating that I give a movie that is a five star movie, but it doesn't have an extra oomph that makes it like my favorite movie, like my kind of five star movie. So these are all very recommendable. Definitely add these to your watch list. Definitely watch these movies. And I'm going to try to get through this as fast as I can because my battery's about to die. First up, we have American Fiction from 2023, directed by Core Jefferson. I was able to see this in theaters. Jeffrey Wright, I will watch everything that Jeffrey Wright is in. He is such a good actor. He is so funny. His delivery is impeccable. He's good to watch. He's so fun to watch. This, mo this movie is a conversation on the publishing industry. It's a conversation on black people in the publishing industry. Um, it's a conversation on family. It touches a lot of good points and I had a blast watching it. It's so funny. It's so tongue in cheek. Um, it's it's definitely a very educational and fun watch. Next, I watched Moulin Rouge for the first time from 2001, directed by the one and only Baz Luhrmann. Um, I actually saw this on Broadway, and then my friends were like, you've never seen this movie? And I was like, nope. And so we watched the movie. Um, the music, it was not what I was expecting. I didn't think that it would be like, uh, modern songs. I thought that it would maybe, I don't know, be like its own original soundtrack. So the modernness of it, I don't love it, but I felt like the movie was so well made. It's like my cup of tea, very theater-esque, very dramatic. Um, Nicole Kidman kills it. I love her. Next we have Tongues Untied from 1989, directed by Marlon Riggs. This is a story about um, black gay men and two in particular, we follow their story. Um, it is such an artful movie. It has poetry and dancing, um, body performance. I mean, there's just, there is a lot to this movie and it really holds, like it really nails home the lesson of like, please take care of your friends who are marginalized. Like, please check up on them and please help them when they ask for it and ask if they need help because chances are they might need help with something that you as a white person can definitely help them and get no repercussions from and i think that that is an important statement and important lesson that, that white people should remember and keep close to them next ooh, i am so excited this is eve's bayou from 1997 directed by kazi lemons i love this movie it is a magical witchy louisiana vibe um i had a, such a good time watching this samuel L. jackson's in this movie it's about a little girl who out acts samuel l jackson by the way she kills it her name is journey smollett 
and she I had such a great time watching this movie for her performance alone. She does so good. It's it's a family drama, um, but you can just feel every emotion in this movie. You can feel how hot it is in this movie. You can feel how troubled this movie is. It's definitely worth the watch. It's very immersive, good acting, great story. Next, we have The Promised Land from 2023, directed by Nicolaj Arcel. I'm so excited because I actually won a signed poster of this movie from the Letterbox Instagram account. Um, it's signed by the director and it's signed by Mads Mikkelsen, which I'm so excited about. I haven't gotten it yet, but I will definitely show you guys when I get it. Um, it'll probably be up on the wall, actually. This movie is really cool. I love movies about people who persevere, people who like have a lot of obstacles and they just like keep working hard to get to their final destination, to their final outcome. And it's about a man who tries to plant in a area of the land where no one has ever been able to plant anything and he plants potatoes and they succeed um, he fails he succeeds he fails he succeeds it's so worth the watch it's a little slow like it's a slow burn for sure but I had a great time watching it oh my gosh I watched another documentary okay and this one's probably my favorite one so far this one is horror noir a history of black horror and it's literally that it's a documentary on black people in horror how um, they were depicted in horror from the very beginning in 1920 with uh, birth of a nation up until uh, get out from Jordan Peele just showing like the trajectory plane that black people have had to overcome from in being depicted in horror movies from the earliest of film times in America up until how successful Get Out was and how represented that movie was for them. There is a lot of conversation and a lot of interview with a lot of black actors in this movie, um, a lot of like film critics, a lot of black directors. Um, I love I love documentaries about movies. It's probably my favorite kind of documentary, honestly. Like true crime, sometimes I can watch such a good true crime one that just really sticks with me, but I feel like documentaries about movies always stay so much closer to my heart. Cause I just, I just love learning about movies. I just love learning about movies. I love putting new movies on my watch list because of documentaries that I've seen. And this one is so good. So necessary to watch in my opinion, especially as a horror lover. I really, really recommend this. Next we have Set It Off from 1997 by F. Gary Gary. This is a heist film starring Jada Pickett Smith and she kills it. This movie is so fun. It's very serious, but I had such a good time watching it. I love a heist film and this is an all female cast. It was so refreshing to watch something like this. Really, I really had a good time. Ooh, the next four and a half star watch that I have is Twilight from 2008, directed by the one, the only, Katherine Hardwick. I love this movie. This movie is so perfect to me. It's nostalgic, it is fun, it's goofy, it's silly. The acting is so fun. <laughs> um, I love the atmosphere of Forks. I love that it's low budget and I love that they really put a lot of their heart into this movie. I'm gonna have so much more to say about this in my Twilight review video, so just look out for that, okay? Uh, next we have Cooley High from 1975. It's directed by Michael Schultz. Um, it's a high school coming of age movie. It's one of the best I've seen. It's really funny. The dialogue is hilarious. I loved all the characters. I fell in love with all the characters. Really just solid square round movie where like the conflict is scary, the conflict is good, the jokes are funny. There's a lot of high stakes, but it's like a lot of funniness. Like There's a lot of bullies and it's a um, good movie. Oh, I'm excited for this one. I watched Training Day from 2001, directed by Antoine Fuqua, I think is how you say his name. This is a Denzel Washington movie through and through, and I have never tried to watch a lot of Denzel Washington's movies. Like, he'll show up in a movie, and I'm like, ah, oh, it's Denzel Washington. But watching this, I'm like, wait a minute, this man? Like, he, I get it now. Like, I get why he is considered one of the best actors of our time. He killed this movie. He ate it up on a plate. He, this is a movie I would rewatch and rewatch and rewatch. It is a very well made movie. Action packed, it's scary, it's high stakes. I had a great time. I rewatched Barbie from 2023, directed by the one, the only Greta Gerwig. What can I say about this movie? If you haven't watched this movie, watch this movie. This is like my sixth or seventh time rewatching it. 
it goes to show. The final four and a half star movie that I watched last month was That Darn Cat from 1965, directed by Robert Stevenson. Robert Stevenson has never missed for me. He makes great movies. He makes really good family fun movies. This one centers around a cat. Um, basically, this cat is like the missing link between a kidnapping that's happened and um, the FBI have to follow the cat to find out where the kidnapping happened and everything and where the uh, hostage is. It's so much fun. It's like such a goofy movie. And the reason why I love it so much is because there's like, like eight to 10 side characters and they all have such ample screen time. They all have such funny lines. Like there's no one wasted in this movie. And I love, I love when a movie is like that, when every character is so essential to the plot and I love the characters. I love the characters in this movie. Okay, we are at the end, ladies and gentlemen. I watched three five-star movies last month. Two of them were rewatches, so only one of them really counts in my mind. The first one was Party Girl from 1995, directed by Vasey Don Schirler Mayer. I love this movie. I watched this movie to start off my Cozy with Posey series. Parker Posey, she kills this movie. She eats this movie. She licks the plate off this movie. I love this movie. I can't wait to own it. And the Criterion needs to put it on their collection immediately. I will pre-order it the minute I find out it's there. The next five-star movie I watched was also a rewatch, The Lighthouse from, from 2019, directed by Robert Eggers. Who doesn't love this movie? If you haven't seen this movie yet, seriously watch this movie. It is artful. It is artistic. It is a character study. It is a dialogue study. I mean, it is the kind of movie that you watch when you want to watch a perfect movie. Not even joking. Not even joking. Watch this movie immediately. It's five stars. It's five stars of perfection. And ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, the final five star movie that I watched last month, which is the first newly watched five star movie that I've seen in the year of 2024 was Ginger Snaps from the year 2000. It's directed by John Fawcett. It's about these two misfit sisters who on the day that one of them gets her period for the first time, she starts turning into a werewolf. And that's all I'm gonna say about it because that's all you need to know before you realize that you should watch this movie. One thing about it, if you saw another Cinderella story with Selena Gomez growing up, um, the two girls who play the stepsisters in that movie are the main characters in this movie. Like they're BFFs in this movie too. And um, that alone is iconic for me. That alone means so much to me because I loved another Cinderella story growing up. But Ginger Snaps is like, ooh, the werewolf is so cool. The concept of like the talk around like femininity and growing up and coming of age and being a girl it's just it's a ooh, it's a me movie it's my kind of movie okay all right if you made it to this end thank you so much for watching i love talking about the movies that i watched um, i hope you enjoyed it um please don't forget to subscribe you can follow me on letterboxd so you can get in the moment updates of the movies that I'm watching. I just watched a really good movie last night for the month of March and I'm excited to already talk about it with you guys. But yeah, that was my February 2024, everything that I watched wrapped up. Um, I'll see you guys later. Bye.